What's good with the gang around the globe, man? It's your boy Weezy. We back again with another video. Global gang, man. We about to be checking out top 10 terrifying facts about Mari Warriors, man. Am I pronouncing that right? Mari, let me let me know. I'm like Ma Mari, Mari, Mari or Mori? I think it's Mari, man. Y'all let me know in the comment section, but we about to go ahead and get right into it. Um, if you're new to the channel, you already know what to do, man. Hit that sub button to join the global game. Hit that like button. Let's get into it, man. Shout out to Top 10 for this video. Whistler, you're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, we're looking at the top 10 terrifying facts about Maori warriors. Maori. Maori. Number 10. Their tattoos were carved in. Tattoos Damn. held a special significance to the Maori carved? people and meant both men and women would okay. get them. did not know that they were carved in. Them. The most common place to get them was the face, but some Maori people were known to get their necks, torsos, and arms tattooed as well. Most Maoris started getting their tattoos during adolescence. Each design was unique, but generally they were in the shape of spirals. They were tattooed on during a ceremony, and each line showed the person's bravery and strength. After all, these tattoos weren't put oh on using gosh. a needle gun. Instead, they were carved into the skin using a mallet and a chisel that was made from bone, and the ink was made from a What? A mallet and a chisel? And fat. This left the skin with grew. Oh, what was the stuff made all out of? These tattoos weren't put on using a needle gun. Instead, they were carved into the skin using a mallet and a chisel that was made from bone, and the ink was made from ash and fat. This left the skin with grooves fat. like a record instead of being smooth like modern tattoos. Number 9. The War Dance One of the most notable traditions the used by Maori warriors and still used by many of their national sports teams today is the traditional native dance called the haka. During the dance, yeah, the participants say a chant, one, right? stamp their feet, stick out their tongue, yeah, we know about that one. and bulge. Yeah, go ahead and hit that like button for me knowing about that. Yeah. Out their eyes. Yeah. While the dance was often performed to welcome special guests, it was actually developed for war. The dance was used in two different ways. The first is that it was used to intimidate their opponents. The other way it was used was that it was performed before a battle during a ritual. If there was something wrong with the dance, then the elders were sure that it was a bad omen. This gave them the chance to either abandon or modify their plans. Number 8. The Mere Club was used to crack skulls. The Mere Club yeah. was oh the most God. common weapon used by Maori warriors. I will say this, that shit look hard as hell. Don't look like it's... You ain't cracking that. That, that looked like it's going upside your head and ain't giving nothing. It was in the shape of a teardrop and made from bone, jade, or stone. They were often decorated and considered heirlooms since it took so long to craft one. They are a blunt force weapon and were used in close range fighting. Often a Maori warrior would attack an opposing tribesman by swinging the mere club down on his shoulder. This would hopefully Damn. break the collarbone or dislocate or break the shoulder. Then the opponents would be unable to defend himself against a blow to the head, often to the temple. Behind the temple is the Tarian, which is the weakest point of the skull. Since the skull is so thin there, it usually only took one blow to that area to kill an opposing warrior. Number 7. Mm. The dead were buried and dug back up again and then reburied. What? The Maori had a very unusual method for burying their dead. Starting early in their culture, the Maori people began to bury people twice. First, after a week or two of mourning, the body was wrapped in mats and then would be buried and allowed to decompose. Then, a year later, the bodies were dug up and the bones were scraped to remove any remaining flesh. What? The bones were then painted with red ochre, which is a natural pigment, and taken to different settlements where they once again mourned the dead. Then there was another ceremony before they were buried again in a sacred place. Once the second burial was complete, the person's soul would go on to their mystery. Bro, that's not kind of like scary though, like... I know it's their culture thing, but that seemed like that would be scary to me. You burying somebody, then you taking them back up, then you be burying them. Well, that's, that's just afterlife. too much for me, Number man. Number six, the war strategy. A war party called a hapu usually never consisted of more than 100 men, and in some cases, women fought as well. Sometimes multiple hapus would come together, but with more warriors, they became less organized. Warriors were also trained from a young age, and every male was trained as a warrior. One specific thing they worked on was wrist strength. This would make their weapons, like the mirror, much more effective. How yeah, the Maoris wrist. would attack other tribes is by traveling to enemy settlements quietly or pretending they were out on a hunting expedition. Once they got close, they would attack often at dawn. All the men were killed because this eliminated the chance that any tribesmen could come back and seek revenge. The women were also taken as a prize of war. Number 5. Heads of the killed were taken as trophies. Heads held a special significance to the Maori people, okay. and they were known to take the heads of their fallen enemies. 
Once they had the head, they would remove the brain and the eyes. Next, all the orifices what? were sealed with flax fiber and gum. The head was then boiled or steamed in an oven. Then the heads were dried in the sun for several days, and they were treated with. Sh no, that right there, man. Come on, bro. That's just that's just just over the top, bro. That's over the top. I don't care who you are. Where are you from, bro? That's just over the top. Shark oil. One reason why they kept the heads of their enemies was that so they could mock it later. One missionary mock said he watched one chief say to the head of an enemy chief, Dane, You wanted to run away, didn't you? But my green stone club overtook you, and after you were cooked, you were made food for me. And where is your father? Ate, oh, hold on, and then they ate him? And where is your brother? He is eaten. And where is your wife? There she sits, a wife for me. And where are your children? There they are, loads on their backs, carrying food as my slaves. Hey. If that wasn't insulting enough, they also developed a bizarre game with the heads. They would pile them in a heap what? and set to the head of the principal chief on the top of the pile. <sighs> then, using stones or other heads, they took turns trying to knock off the head at the top of the pile. Number four, Captain James Cook's first encounter was terrifying. The first encounter between the Europeans and the Maori was in December of 1646, when a Dutch ship made landfall near a Maori tribe. Now that's who here they should have took off. Any anybody trying to come mess with them, trying to take their land and stuff or whatever. That's that's who here they should have took off. Both groups were standoffish, and this led to a small fight that resulted in deaths on both sides. After the run-in, the Dutch sailed off, and Europeans would not go back until October 1767, when English navigator James Cook traveled there looking for the fabled Fourth Continent. When Captain uh. Cook first encountered the Maori, they sent out two war canoes to meet them. When the canoes approached, two full-grown Maori warriors, complete with face tattoos, stood up and held the shrunken heads of their latest opponents, who were also covered with tattoos. Cook and his crew immediately noticed the detail on the faces and knew the heads were real. Cook wanted to interact uh, with the Maori yeah. peacefully, but there were some misunderstandings and the Maori acted aggressively. As a result, the Europeans were supposedly forced to kill a few Maori in self-defense, much to the dismay of Cook. To convince them that they had come in peace, Cook and his men ended up kidnapping some Maori warriors. They acted kindly to them and then let them go. This led to a better relationship between the Maori and the Europeans, which would play an important role in the shaping of New Zealand. Number 3. Their mm. Most Famous Warrior, Hongi Hika it is believed that the most famous Maori chief, Hongi Hika, was born in 1778. As a young man, he was a fierce and agile warrior who rose up through the ranks of his tribe. His chief got along with the Europeans and also saw the value of muskets in warfare. The chief managed to trade with the Europeans for several guns and ammo in 1808. The tribe then got into a war with another tribe. Hika's tribe fired off their first shots with their muskets, but the problem with the muskets is that they take at least 20 seconds to reload. <laughs> the other tribe used this time to- Could you imagine, bro? You gotta reload, bro. One shot and you gotta do all this just for another shot, to bro. Attack. Many members of Hika's seconds, tribe, including the chief, were slaughtered. Hongi Hika was one of the lucky few to get away. With the chief dead, Hongi Hika was the most senior, so he took control of the tribe. The defeat, however, could have well discouraged Hongi Hika from using muskets. However, he had the foresight to see the muskets could be an incredibly important part of warfare. So he got closer to the Europeans, even visiting Australia and England, where he became a bit of a sensation because of his tattoos. He even converted to Christianity and set up the first Christian mission in New Zealand. This relationship to the church gave Hongi Hika access to more rifles because he vowed to become a defender of the church. However, he wasn't simply given all the guns, instead trading for them. As for what the Europeans wanted in exchange for the guns, well, that was shrunken heads. In fact, as the trade became more common, slaves wow. and prisoners of war were brought to the Europeans, and they chose which heads they wanted. The Maori then tattooed wow. the chosen victim and decapitated them. The market got so flooded with Maori heads that they were being sold for as little as two pounds, which was about a week's wage in England for a working man. Nevertheless, Hongihiko was able to amass over 3,000 guns and plenty of ammo and gunpowder in his 10 years as chief. Starting in 1818, his tribe slaughtered other tribes and took their women. Within a year, he had complete control over northern New Zealand. However, other tribes soon followed in Hongihika's footsteps and bought their own guns. Hongihika was killed when he took a bullet in the lung in 1828. Number 2. Infanticide like other warrior cultures, the Maoris committed infanticide. Females were more likely to be killed because tribes needed more males, since every male was a warrior and there needed to be a decent number of warriors to ensure the security of the tribe. Also, males were more likely to be killed in battle, meaning that there would have been an upset in the sex ratios later in life. Infanticide was also common if there was anything wrong with the baby. 
Essentially, there were five ways that the infants were killed. Their skulls could be crushed, they could be drowned in a stone what basin, in the world? suffocation, or finally, the most disturbing way was that the mothers would press against the soft spot on the skull and kill the baby instantly. What? Well, isn't that cheery? Hey, we can't say we didn't warn you. Terrifying is right the there hell? in the title. Number 1. They Performed Cannibalism whether the Maori warriors committed cannibalism or not is highly debated. Some historians believe that it was just Europeans trying to paint the Maoris as wild savages. However, besides witness accounts of cannibalism, tribal oral histories, and archaeological evidence also strongly suggest that the Maori warriors indulged in cannibalizing vanquished enemies. There are a few reasons that the Maori ate their they opponents, talking about, and they it wasn't talking because about that earlier that they was eating their enemies and stuff. I don't know what y'all think, man. They were hungry. One was to internalize their spirits, which they called mana. Another theory is that cannibalism was part of their post-battle rage. Another is that it would send a message to enemies. They thought that the greatest humiliation you could do your enemy was to kill them, chop them up, eat them, and then excrete them out. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button wow, below, man. and don't forget. Well, we learned we learned a lot of stuff there. Y'all, let me know in the comment section: is all of this true or what's not true? Man, I know you know sometimes there could be some false information out there. So that's why I need y'all in the comment section. Let me know, and also let me know what y'all think about this video, man. Let me know what we need to check out next. And also, man, if you are watching this from New Zealand or wherever you're watching this from, man, let me know in the comment section where you're watching it, watching this video from. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Want more videos like this? Subscribe to the Global Gang if you're new. Make sure you turn post notifications on, man. And you already know, man. Follow your boy on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch. Because you know why? Because the grind never, ever stops, man.